Welcome to the unit on modern history. This unit aims to provide you with an overview of this eventful period. This unit comprises of five modules. Each module has a final review section that invites you to reflect on what you have learned. We begin by briefly reviewing the highlights of the Edwardian period. In 1900, Couturiers display their designs at an exposition universelle that was held in Paris. Queen Victoria dies and Edward VII assumes the throne. Famous personalities during the time include Pablo Picasso, Paul Poirot, Mariano Fortuny, Albert Einstein, Henry Ford, Erte, etc. This period also witnessed the first successful flight by the Wright brothers the launch of the Model T automobile by Ford, the first newsreel film shown in Paris, and Einstein's formulation of the theory of relativity. During this period, women wore more comfortable practical clothes that were required for their more active participation in the variety of jobs that they had taken over from men. A relatively short skirt several inches above the ankle and fairly wide around the hem. Military influences were evident in the cut of some jackets and coats. Some of the clothes worn by soldiers passed into use by the general public. A sleeveless vest-like garment was so popular among soldiers that they continued to wear it after the war. These vests were sold at army surplus stores and manufacturers added sleeves and a zip at the front and made the first sports outdoor jacket. Some important designers of the time include Duché, Paquin, Roof, Cheruit, Callot, Sewers, Redfern, Worth and Paul, Paul Poirot. Paul Poirot made the corset obsolete. While making gowns that were loose and free, he put women into hobble skirts with hems so narrow they could hardly move. He is famous for using vivid colours inspired from oriental styles and the popularity of the Russian ballet, whose costumes were designed by Leon Baxt. While Poirot was unique for his times, Spanish-born Mariano Fortuny's designs were considered timeless. He drew inspirations from non-European cultures. Most notable are his Delphus gown from ancient Greece, along with Renaissance and Oriental motifs that appear frequently in his textile designs. Another important designer was Jean Paquin, a French fashion designer known for her innovative and modern designs. She was the first woman to open a fashion house. The Maison Paquin quickly became known for its 18th century inspired pastel evening dresses and tailored date dresses, as well as for its numerous publicity stunts, including organizing fashion parades to promote her new models and sending her models to operas and races in order to show off her designs. Paquin also frequently collaborated with the illustrators and architects for the creation of stage costumes. The publication of dress albums, the decoration of her private residences, reinforcing her reputation as a thoroughly modern designer. During this period, trade routes with Japan were opened in 1850 and this influenced art and fashion. Influences from Japan art was seen in Impressionism. Kimonos became popular for leisure at home wear for both men and women. The cuts of women's clothing grew less structured. Fabric designs and colors showed more oriental influences. The main source of information of costumes for this period are surviving clothes from the period, photographs, magazines, mail order catalogues, store catalogues and motion pictures. The costumes for women varied according to the period as shown in this timeline. During the Edwardian period, the emphasis was on the S-shaped silhouette. Frilly decorative petticoats and drawers con continued to be popular. Ribbons inserted through eyelets, ruffles and lace edgings were popular in underclothing. The brassiere appeared first in 1890 and gradually became a basic item of underwear for adult women. 
Typical dresses had high boned collars, full pouched bodices and skirts that were flat in front and emphasized a rounded hip line in the back. The popular white frilly cotton or linen dresses with this decorations were referred to as lingerie dresses. Bishop sleeves and its variations were predominant. Frilly ruffles, jabots were often placed at the front of the neck for that fullness. The shape of skirts was achieved by goring or panelling. A tailor-made was a woman's suit which was popularly worn by women. Separate blouses called shirt waists came in great variety and had features like the bodices of daytime dresses. Tea gowns were worn by affluent women, fortune loose-fitting gowns. Evening dresses followed the same silhouette as the daytime dresses with necklines that were generally low, square, round or V-shaped. Cloaks and capes with high standing Medici collars with wide revers were also worn. Hair was arranged full and loose around the face or was pulled into a chignon or bun at the back of the neck. The pompadour was a style with hair built high in front and at the sides around the face. Hat, hat styles were large, wide, brimmed picture hats and sometimes included brimless toques. Decorations were lavish with artificial flowers, lace, buckles, feathers and bird wings. Hair ornaments worn for evenings included feather, jeweled combs and small skull caps of pearl called Juliet caps. For footwear, stockings of dark or neutral cotton lyle were often worn during the day and silk for formal wear. Some were decorated with colored clocks, designs knitted into the stockings or lace insertions. Shoes had pointed toes. Long slender lines and heels about two to two and a half inches high that were curved in and were called the Louis style. Boots were less fashionable but were worn high and buttoned or, or laced closed. Accessories included large flat muffs, suede or leather daytime handbags or beaded evening bags. Decorative lace or silk parasols were trimmed with fringe or lace. For evening, women carried long folding fans or ostrich fans. Swiss belts were revived from 1860s. Ruffles, boas, ribbons or cravats were worn around the neck. Jewelry was often inspired by Art Nouveau style. Clasps, brooches, pendants, necklaces, dog collars and long necklaces uh, with pen pendants or single stone earrings were the main jewelry that was worn. Underwear included brassiere, straight corset, knickers and a chemise comparatively lesser in quantity than other periods. The silhouette was becoming narrower and straighter. The location of the waistline moved upward. Skirts narrowed and grew shorter. The high-boned collars gradually went out of fashion. Details like military collars, ruffle jabots and wide revers or lapels were seen in the costume. Oriental influences were also evident in cut and draping styles. Front buttoned closings were used. Sleeves tended to be tight fitting, ending below or at the wrist with cuffs of contrasting color. Skirts became so narrow at the hemline that it impeded walking. These skirts were called hobble skirts. Slits had to be made to enable comfortable walking. Peg top skirts were also popular. Tunics were worn over skirts. Paul Poirot designed exotic tunic styles like the minaret tunic. Jackets of tailored suits were cut to below the hips with an overall line that was long and slender. Man tailored shirt waist blouses complete with neckties and high tight collars were worn with separate skirts or tailored suits. For evenings, both Empire Revival and Oriental influences were evident. Evening dresses had tunics of layers of sheer fabric placed over heavier fabric. Trains were popular, sleeves were short, often kimono style and of sheer fabric. Hair was less bouffant now. 
Hair was waved softly around the face and pulled into a soft roll at the back or top of the head. Large hats were tall to emphasize height, brimless talk styles, turned up brims. Face veils were popular. Hats were decorated with artificial flowers, feathers and ribbons. During the First World War, brassieres were widely available. A combination garment that put together a camisole with a skirt that buttoned under the crotch to form drawers was called caminicas. During the wartime years, the silhouette of women's clothes grew wider and skirts shorter. Although they did maintain fullness through use of pleats, gatherings or gores. Waistline was at the natural waist and sometimes slightly above. The fit of bodices was easy and waistlines defined by loose-fitting belts. Necklines were V or square-shaped. Some were edged with sailor collars. Sleeves were generally straight and fitted. Tailored suits became even more popular and had a distinct military look. Special features of blouses were sleeves and yoke cut in one Lego mutton sleeves and Medici or standing collars with necks open. Knitted sweater that pulled on over the head or pullovers became popular. Gabrielle Chanel is credited with this introduction. For evening, skirts were full with many having tiers or ruffles, floating panels of fabric or layers of varying lengths. Decolletage necklines were filled with flesh colored or transparent fabric. Sleeves were worn short to the elbow. Sleeveless dresses had only, only narrow straps over the shoulder. Hair was worn closer to the face and shorter. More women tried permanent waves. Hats were high rather than wide and smaller than before the war. They were often without brims and worn with veils. For footwear, stockings were dark for daytime and pale for evening. Rayon, also called artificial silk, stockings were also introduced. Shoes were more visible with higher hemlines. After the First World War, there was a transitional period from wartime styles to 1920s. A silhouette called the barrel shape was seen with wide waists and narrow hemlines. After the war, the hemlines dipped to ankles again. Jean Lavant is credited with the chemise dress, a straight tube of the type that would become fashionable in the 1920s. Men's underwear was primarily made from wool and cotton. Union suits with drawers and underwear is one which was popular. Suits consisting of jacket, vest and trousers were worn with the shirt and necktie, were appropriate dress wear for professional and business employees during the work week. Laboring men wore sturdy work clothes. For special occasions, all men wore suits. For informal social occasions like leisure or sports, men would wear a sports jacket, trousers and shirts of various kinds. In the early years of the century, jackets and coats were cut long, buttoned high and had small lapels. Their foot full cut through the torso gave men an almost barrel-chested appearance. During the First World War, jackets and coats gradually shortened, silhouettes narrowed, shoulder lines became less padded and more natural. Frock coats were worn by dignitaries on formal special occasions. Morning coats were worn for daytime for formal occasions with matching trousers or contrasting waistcoats and striped trousers before the war. After the war, this costume was limited to upper class or political leaders for formal occasions. Sack jackets, also known as a lounge coat, became the standard suit jacket, also worn as a sports jacket. Shirts were worn in all colors, in solids as well as patterns. Their collars were high and stiff. After the war, collars with less rigidly starched collars were preferred. Some collars were also detachable. Necktie varieties included bow ties, foreign hand ties, standard neckties and ascots. Trousers were generally cut loose around the hips and narrowed towards the bottom. Some had turned up cuffs and some had crisp creases in the front. 
For evenings, men wore tailcoats, double-breasted but worn unbuttoned, or tuxedo jackets with matching trousers, with a row or two of braid placed along the outer seam, and a dark or white waistcoat. Dinner jackets were tuxedo style, sack cut and usually single-breasted. Shirt fronts were pleated and had winged collars. Sweaters were worn by working class men. Collarless cardigans that opened down the front, v-necked pullovers and high collared styles similar to modern turtlenecks were also worn. Overcoats were full to accommodate the wide cut suit of the first decade and became more fitted in the second. Top coats ended at the hip. Basic styles included Chesterfields, Ulcers, Inverness, Macintosh and trench coats. The blazer was worn with unmatched trousers for sporting events like tennis, yachting or other sports. Jodhpuris were known were worn for horse riding. Swimming suits consisted of a pair of drawers or naked, knitted wool suit made up of fitted knee-length breeches and a shirt with short or no sleeves or a one-piece short-legged round-necked sleeveless tank suit. Men wore flannel trousers and sports coat for driving. However, leather motoring coats were more practical. On their heads, they wore goggles and peaked caps, worn backwards to avoid having them blown off. Menswear at home consisted of dressing gowns and smoking jackets, some of which had quilted lapels and were made in decorative fabrics. Night shirts were still worn by many men, but others wore pajamas. Hair was kept short and faces were kept clean-shaven. Hairstyles remained much the same as those in the latter part of the 19th century, including top hats for formal occasions, soft felt hats with names as Homburg or Trilby, Derbys and caps for leisure. Western-style Stetson felt hats were worn in some parts of USA. For summer, Panama hats, straw boaters and linen hats made in derby or fedora-like shapes were worn. For footwear, stockings were usually neutral colours. Some were made with few stripes or in multicoloured styles. Stockings had ribbed tops and were held up with elastic garters. Shoes had long, pointed toes and laced or buttoned to close. Many were cut high, above the ankle. For evenings, black patent leather slippers were popular. Oxford, which were low laced shoes, gained popularity. Others were two-toned. By the end of the decade, rounded toe became more popular. Accessories included gloves, handkerchiefs and scarves. Walking sticks were popular until automobiles became widespread in use. Jewelry was limited to tie pins, shirt studs, rings and cufflinks. Wrist watches gained popularity with the automobiles. Girls of all ages wore white, light or cream-coloured lingerie dresses cut with waistlines low on the hip. Decorations consisted of embroidery, smocking and lace. Other styles had more natural waistlines and full-bloused bodices like those of adult women. For school, navy blue serge was popular, as were sailor dresses, hats and pinafores which worked as outerwear as well. Skirts were knee-length and longer. Gym tunics were worn over blouses, had sleeveless yokes, square necks and belted full pleated bodices. High laced shoes were worn by girls. For dresses, they wore flat slippers with one or more straps across the instep or a flat shoe with an ankle strap. Stockings tended to be knee-high. Most small boys dressed in skirts until the age of three or four. From 1910 onwards, boys wore rompers and when they got a little older, knickers. Boys wore sailor suits, Eton suits, Norfolk jackets and a sack suit, all with or without belts. Younger boys wore shorts or knickers with jackets. Older boys wore longer pants. For outdoors, boys wore Mackinac coats in plaid or plain colours, long cardigan sweaters or turtleneck sweaters. Boys wore high-laced shoes with knee-length stockings.